Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, July 5th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Hillary Clinton is above the law, and the fix is in. She's been cleared by the FBI just days after Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch's secret meeting on a private plane. I'm going to make him an offer again. <laughs> Hillary Clinton has clearly tainted goods. It's obvious she lied, that she had classified emails that were transmitted over her server that she knew about and should have known about, but yet she's not going to be prosecuted. Then, radio talk show host Lionel says the FBI is wrong not to prosecute Crooked Hillary. So what Loretta Lynch should have said was, guess what, Bill? You really screwed up because I was your only hope. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars. Well, while we were all busy this weekend celebrating our Independence Day, Hillary Clinton was, of course, meeting with the FBI celebrating her independence. That's right. She's free. She won't be rounded up, put in handcuffs and carted off to jail where we all think she needs to be. Of course, Americans are reacting with fury. If Hillary doesn't follow the law, why should I? Joining me in studio is David Knight. Now, David, I mean, I was just gobsmacked by the uh, the press briefing today with the FBI director saying that Clinton and her aides were just extremely careless. Yeah, they couldn't care less. Yeah, yeah. Well, she said all along that these were documents that were not classified when she got them. He directly contradicted her. So even though at the beginning I thought that he wasn't going to indict her, when he said that, I thought, wow, they're going to go for an indictment. And yet, amazingly, after he said that, then he went on and said, no, there's nothing to see. Move along here. But don't you try this at home because we'll send you to jail. Look, there are technical issues here. This server just just didn't happen to uh, put itself together. And there's also legal, ethical issues, corruption issues. This is a replay of what we saw with the Chinese. We've seen this developed. And as Alex Jones has pointed out, this could very well have just been a drop box to give her plausible deniability to pass secrets onto the Chinese. And of course, David, one of the most interesting things that the FBI director said was that no reasonable prosecutor would take this case. We are flabbergasted by that because it seems as they've yeah. taken this particular case before in the past. So we decided to bring on a reasonable prosecutor, find <laughs> out you know, what he thinks. Welcome to the show, Lionel, of course, Emmy award winning television news decoder and legal analyst, as well as a licensed trial lawyer and former prosecutor. What do you think about this? Well, first of all, a couple of things here. Um, let, let me give you the, the official academic answer, and then we'll get to the bottom line. Number one, the prosecution has a duty to bring justice. The prosecutor and the FBI is the police department uh, version of the prosecution. Think about it this way. The cops go out, they make the arrest, they do the investigation, then they turn that case over to the DA. The DA charges somebody with burglary or murder or whatever it is. So the cops do the initial investigation. The cops don't tell the, the prosecutor or the state attorney or the district attorney what to do. The, the, the cops will make a recommendation. The cops will, will tell the DA, look, this is a bad case, a lousy case. Here's our input. But the cops never announce, and there's no reason why this should be charged. Because no reasonable prosecutor, yes. a DA would say, whoa, whoa, excuse me, Chief <laughs> Friendly. Yeah. Excuse me, Chief of Police, McAdoo, <laughs> Knight. Who are you to tell me? No, 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 no. So that right off the bat was very interesting. Yeah. So, but, but let me go back to, to what I was saying, though. That prosecution, FBI, their job is just not to get convictions, not to charge people. So that's okay. The problem with this is that there were myriad reasons why they could have charged Hillary Clinton with a misdemeanor, uh, something, something other than nothing to see here, move along. Keep in mind, guys, this, this is in, in view of or the tail end of these weird optics this week with the attorney general and this tarmac confab with the husband of the alleged target who himself could have been a witness, co-defendant, co-conspirator. 
Yeah, and let she, me speak to that. Uh, let me speak to that, Lionel, because, you know, she offered as an excuse saying, hey, we just got together and talked about our close personal relationship. <laughs> Shouldn't the close personal relationship be the reason in the first place that she would recuse herself even before this secret meeting at the tarmac? And the fact is, is that if you look at rules, isn't it true that if you've got a prosecutor and a judge, they look at uh, why they should recuse themselves, is if you've got a personal relationship, a close work relationship, a political relationship, and it's check, 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 all three of those boxes or check for her. She doesn't do that. And then she openly meets with him. Hmm. There is no mandatory rule for a prosecutor to recuse herself in this particular case, just like there's no mandatory reason why a judge should recuse. But 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 my dear learned friends, you're at the highest level of scrutiny and integrity. And there are also Department of Justice rules. So let's let's not get too bogged down. You have the Loretta Lynch issue here, which stunk to high heaven. Right. Because right. what she should have done is, imagine this, Loretta Lynn says, okay, Bill, now you did it. I don't know what you slipped in my drink or what lapse of judgment I just had, but I just went in, first of all, and, and, and it looks, the optics, again, I keep saying optics, of going into this private jet on the tarmac. Well, you know, the hoi polloi like you and me, we're doing the economy class in JetBlue, and they're on the tarmac, so private jets. <laughs> it looks bad. That's number one. So what Loretta Lynch should have said was, guess what, Bill? You really screwed up because I was your only hope. Now I've got to recuse myself because for the longest time, they've been asking me to step down that they demanded a special prosecutor. And I said, no, no, I can maintain my, my, uh, my detached uh, professionalism, but now I can't. So guess who you've got now? Torquemada. You've got the worst pit bull prosecutor because of this, this, this stupidity on your part and my part. Okay, that's the lynch thing. Now, what Comey did today was, and I'm just guessing, let's say I'm Aaron Sorkin and I'm doing a, a screenplay and I'm just being fanciful. Imagine this conversation. Well, Loretta, Loretta, you screwed up this way. Now I've got to go out and punt it for you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fall on the sword. I'm going to basically turn nothing over to you. I'm going to go out, scold Hillary. Part A of my announcement is going to be this, 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 almost this, this indictment of how you have no judgment. You're sloppy. You And you want to be the president? You right. want to handle the three o'clock in the morning call? So I'm going to go out in part A of my announcement. I'm going to just say you're sloppy and you're terrible and you disregard rules and security and the government. Then, then I'm going to do a 180 and say, however, <laughs> however, despite the foregoing, no reasonable prosecutor would do this. Uh, Deutsch notwithstanding, Petraeus notwithstanding, all the whistleblowers, all of the whistleblowers who have been packed away and they're cracking rocks upstate for a host of things. But I'm going to say no reasonable prosecutor. So Loretta, I'm going to get get you off the hook by basically turning over nothing to you. So Loretta can say, well, you heard it from the FBI themselves. So Loretta is saved. Comey is saved. And also keep in mind this. And again, remember, my dear friends, as learned as we are, we're still civilians in this Byzantine world of, of Game of Thrones prosecution and that sort of thing. You don't get to be the FBI director by being a rogue. You don't get to right. be a guy who is looking down the road for oh things like retirement, Wall Street gigs, board of directors of corporations. You don't. You know, as you look to the sunset of your career and really the big time and the big bucks, and you're a company guy. You don't get to be the you you, you don't become the, the FBI director by being a rogue and I think that's and, what she meant. I think that's what he meant by a reasonable prosecutor, a corporate guy <laughs> right. who's looking out for his career. Hey, right. if you want to be reasonable about that, let's talk about some of the specifics, Lionel. He sure. said as he would laid this out, and and at first I told my wife, I said, look, you look at everything that's happened this last week, and he's holding this now the day after the Fourth of July, uh, right. as they unrolled all this stuff over the holiday week, and I said they're letting her walk for sure. But then he starts laying out the criminal case, and he comes in, he says, hey, was there classified information? And then later on, he says, yes, there was classified. 
classified right. information. Was it improperly stored and transmitted? Yes, he says. But then he leaves himself and a subjective out. He says, was it intentional? Was it grossly negligent? And then when he goes on, he says, well, we didn't find it was intentional, even though she had changed the classified headings on some of these issues so that it could get transmitted into her own personal system. Right. He, he goes on to say later on, there is evidence that they were extremely careless. Why is that not grossly negligent when you're talking about this level of security? Look, the particular statutes that we're talking about, there was a there was a FOIA statute. There's Title 18 of USC, United States Code. There's a host of statutes and language that talk about criminal intent, mens rea. You know, do you have the criminal intent to do something? Gross negligence. You know, a lot of times, some of the most very, some of the, 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 the most serious offenses that we can commit do not really involve any kind of, well, scienter, yes, meaning knowing, knowingly doing something, but but this this deliberate intent to defraud, to 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 upend justice. No, sometimes it can be a very simple thing. For example, if you don't file taxes, if you don't pay the government, you can argue all day long as I didn't deliberately do this, I didn't intentionally harm the government. They don't care about that. Do you think Deutsch, the CIA director, do you think Petraeus knowingly, deliberately went to harm this government? No, that's, right. that's not the point. They don't write statutes that give you a way out. Look, let me just leave you, my dear friends, with this. Let's just something, some kernel, some nugget of perhaps hope, hope for justice, not conviction, not indictment. I'm not out to see Hillary Clinton indicted or incarcerated. That's not what I want justice. I want equal treatment under the law. Right. Yeah. But imagine this. Imagine Comey said, well, Hillary, if you go back and listen to what I said, I told the people about my investigation of you and your behavior involving the server. What I didn't mention was this other particular statute, and that is lying to the FBI. Right. Because as you recall, Martha Stewart was sent to the pokey, the Gray Bar Inn, the Who's Gal, not because of insider trading, but because she lied to the FBI. So if you listen carefully, Hillary, what I said was that as far as you violating these server and uh, secure transmission statutes, that's one thing. However, after the fact, we went through all of the testimony and how many times she's met her and talked to the government, I don't know. But whenever you speak to the FBI, and how Hillary Clinton never took the fit, how she actually spoke, allegedly for three and a half hours, you are opening yourself up. And by the way, the Fifth Amendment is not a loophole of the guilty. It's a constitutional right that you have the ability as a citizen to take. The Second Amendment is just as good as the Fifth Amendment. Yeah. But there is something to be said for that. Don't hold your breath, but lying to the government and perjury and giving inconsistent statements under oath, not necessarily to a grand jury itself, but to the FBI. That's the derivative angle in addition to the substantive charges. And so, Hillary Clinton right, well, said that this last week. She said, look, I exposed myself to a very serious crime. Many times they don't charge you with what the initial investigation is about, but they will charge you for inaccurate statements saying that you're lying to the FBI. Lionel, to my cynical mind, I believe that is why Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton met. I believe that it was a briefing to tell, her to tell him precisely where they were going with this, what they knew, to make sure that she was going to have a prepared statement. This is a woman yeah. who's not had a press conference for a about 215 days, and she has everything prepared and laid out for her. I think that was the point of that meeting, quite frankly, in my cynical point of view. I agree. Well, you know, they say just because you're paranoid doesn't mean no one's after you, and just because you're <laughs> cynical doesn't mean you're wrong. So, my friends, as we will find out, this remains to be seen, and please accept my offer to return to these hallowed portals again to discuss and explicate <laughs> this most fascinating subject. Yeah. You know, Lionel, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I just want to get a quick comment from you about his essentially don't try this at home. Right. When he finished up with this, he said, to be clear, this isn't to suggest that in similar circumstances, a person who's not right. running for president, who's not Hillary Clinton, <laughs> uh, engaged in this activity right. would face no consequences. To the contrary, those individuals are often subject to security or administrative sanctions. That's not to say, that's not what we're deciding now. This is simply a special treatment for Hillary Clinton. Yes, that's what he's saying. It only applies to her. Yeah, your comment. Let's imagine right now as we speak, John Kerry decides to go to his basement or his bathroom or hall closet 
put in his own server and do exactly what Hillary Clinton did. Can he expect the same treatment? No. Is that fair? No. Is that reality? Yes. 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 Well, what do we think about the fact that they're trying to tell us that Hillary Clinton was just that ignorant that she did this, and yet we're supposed to put her in the most powerful position? Right. Right. Listen, Is she a criminal or an idiot? Back, yeah. Yeah. Remember when, remember when um, uh, President Obama was uh, asked, do you, do you have a BlackBerry? Well, I do the BlackBerry, but you know, they, I got to have a special one, and I can't use, I don't do it because I got to have the special BlackBerry that they've approved, and it's secured, and you know, I'm the president, and I'd love to be able to do it to get my scores, and, and there was an article this week in the New York Times about how he has his own secure BlackBerry. Remember that? He, yeah. he, he, he can't, you don't want somebody hacking in. And by the way, final question. This fellow, this IT uh, tech who took the fifth 125 times or something, yeah, right? Yeah. Took the fifth for what? If Hillary Clinton did anything wrong, why did he do anything wrong? What is he taking the fifth for? And I, I think that's the key point because when you say that it wasn't intentional, it just didn't happen that she had this complex setup of, of private security. She was putting her own personal secrecy right. above national secrets. That was what this is all about. Exactly. Imagine you, uh, imagine David, you and Leanne are involved in something. Leanne goes into a one room. She's, a, she's investigated by the FBI. She takes a fit 150 times. You answer all the questions. You walk and she says, what the hell did I take the fit? What, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> something's not right here. Well, it so, just seems like all around and in, in every direction, they really do not care anymore what this looks like to the American people yeah. because we all say it stinks to high heaven, but they're just letting us know that they, they can do whatever they want. They're above the let law. Let me leave you sure. with this one. Here's the way the Clintons think. When they do something, when they get away with it, they don't want to get away with it. They want to get, they, they don't <laughs> want to get away with murder. They want the murder to be done at the six o'clock news with a million cameras to say, see? Yes, yes, you know, <laughs> yes, that's it. It's in your and face. Now Absolutely. They well, are Lionel. They have Kevlar. They want to habituate to the idea that they're in a separate gravity field, a parallel universe. That's right. That nothing, <laughs> reality, you're going to even, you're not even going to believe them or your lying eyes, as the great Groucho Marx yeah. said. Well, it definitely feels like we're in the twilight zone. Lionel, thank you so Indeed. much for joining thank us. You. We'll thank have you so back much. soon. Well, stick around because coming up, we're going to break down some of the most damaging things that were said in today's FBI press briefing. Welcome back. Well, if you had any question about it today, it is for fact. The rule of law doesn't mean a damn thing if you are Hillary Clinton. Now, in today's FBI press briefing, uh, the FBI director actually said some pretty damning things, giving off the impression initially, David, that she might actually face some prosecution here. Yeah. But then... Plot and he contradicted twist. what she said. No charges. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important, Leanne, that we look at the fact that he contradicted directly what she said. She had said, I never received or sent anything that was classified. And he said, no, she got 110 emails that were classified when sent or received. So right there, right. they catch her. In fact, you know, maybe she didn't say that to them privately, so she didn't lie to the FBI. She just lied to the American public for a very long time. Then he goes on to say, and then there was additional 2,000 emails that were later up classified. And we've had this discussion before as well. Many of these things, because of the nature of her office, and these are private conversations that are uh, that information is sent out right away, they're later classified, but they are born classified. They're born classified because these are private discussions between other heads of state. And so she knows that. Mm -hmm. She and her husband know that. I want to focus on what he had to say, and I want to focus on the different treatment that we have seen in the past for people who were CIA directors, people who were whistleblowers. And I think it's very interesting to look at the fact, as we mentioned with uh, uh, Lionel uh, just previously, there was it was clear that she had classified information. She sent and received this information. It doesn't matter whether it was 110 or 2010 that she did, okay? Still, she had these classified uh, pieces of information. And was it improperly stored and transmitted? There's no question that that's the case, right. okay? He talks about both of those things. He said that himself. He said yeah. they should never have been on any kind of unclassified system. That's right. So he, But he leaves her an out saying, was it intentional? Was it grossly negligent? Well, we know that it was an intentional thing because she instructed people to overrule the classified markings on these things so they could be transmitted via fax and other means. And we know that it was grossly negligent because she made no attempt to provide security. And this is precisely what we saw in the previous indictment of John Deutsch, who was the CIA director under Bill Clinton in 1996. 
They immediately went in. They raided his home. They took all of his information. They didn't allow his lawyers to take a look at this and cherry pick what they were going to turn over to the FBI. They got everything. And if you look at the statute that they have for this, they say that anybody who is an officer who by virtue of their office becomes possessed of documents or materials containing classified information, knowingly removes such documents or materials without authority with the intent to retain such documents or materials at an unauthorized location. That's why he was convicted and then pardoned by her husband, Bill Clinton. But I want to take a look at Thomas Drake, because I think this is even more egregious, because we have the FBI director saying that uh, we're going to, no reasonable prosecutor would do this, because we're looking at this and we're saying, well, there is evidence of potential violations. There's not, it's not potential, okay? These were actual violations. They were classified, improperly stored, grossly negligent, and as we point out, there is intention. OK, but he says uh, we're, we've had decisions like this in the past and uh, we're not going to do this in the future. OK, in the past, we have handled this differently. Yeah, because the context now is Hillary Clinton right. and the powerful Clintons. And so they're going to let this uh, get a pass. Take a look at the case of Thomas Drake. He's one of the four key whistleblowers of the NSA telling trying to tell people in the wake of uh, September 11th that they were now doing dragnet surveillance on the public. They tried to go to the uh, uh, Congress. They did it uh, that way. They were shut down repeatedly. Nobody wanted to hear that story. And eventually they came after him. They charged him with 10 felony counts, five under the Espionage Act, one obstruction of justice statement, four for making false statements to the FBI. There you go. There's that, that right. hook they always put on you, making false statements to the FBI. They, he was facing 35 years in prison. They completely destroyed his life. Okay. One of the documents that he had, was what a success, quote unquote. It's a document that was the subject of the first count, okay? The, remember, there's only uh, four documents that they came after, four or five documents, okay? It was classified as secret on the day they found it in his home. It was not a classified document. It was later declassified by the NSA, yet they continued to try to prosecute him. It was a persecution because he was a whistleblower. He said they came to him and they said, uh, Drake, you are screwed. They said, we're going to send you to jail. And they had another document. They said, he said, I was made an enemy of the state just because they said I was. Hillary Clinton is exonerated just because they say she's exonerated. Now, here's one of the other documents they had. It listed a schedule of meetings about a project called Turbulence, just listed the schedule of meetings. It was marked unclassified for official use only. It was also posted on the NSA's internal website. The government since argued the schedule should have been classified, and he should have known that it should have been classified. A schedule of meetings, huh. that was all it had. They said, you should have known that was classified, even though it wasn't. Should Hillary have known that her private conversations with foreign heads of state were classified? Of course she should have. And the director knows that as well. This is criminal what he did. And to say that don't think that you're going to get away with this in the future, anybody else. This is special treatment for Hillary Clinton. The fact that he would say that in this indictment is the most amazing thing out of all of these lies that we've right. seen unfolding in this last week, this collusion between the Justice Department, the State Department, and this criminal FBI. This guy is at the level of criminal corruption that we saw with J. Edgar Hoover. That's one of the most amazing things I've seen, Leanne. Right. I mean, and that's, to, it's like, what do they have over him? To, he would come out and admit, you know, here's some of these things, but we're going to, you know, not this time. So now we also know that uh, she did certify under penalty of perjury that she'd fully complied with this court order to hand over all of her official emails to the State Department. But we learned last week that of the many emails that she actually withheld, one of them was a very damning email shedding light on how this bootleg server that she had set up um, was a huge security threat and that caused the State Department to temporarily lower temporarily lower its uh, secure systems firewall. So they had to lower the firewall. Don't send any emails we've been hacked into. And we know that there were other work emails not turned over by Clinton. And we actually learned about this uh, during one of the Benghazi hearing and her response to that, you know, why didn't you hand over everything that had to do with Sidney Blumenthal, yeah. your secret yeah. uh, person here that's telling you all about your job? Well, she said that it wasn't she wasn't under any obligation to turn over those emails if she didn't personally decide that they were work related. So Just she imperial. made herself the boss over what needs Absolutely. to be subject to FOIA request. And we have to look at this and say, is this a case, as Alex pointed out, I think it, I personally believe this is a case 
of plausible deniability so she can put a drop box in here to pass information to sources who are going to give them money. Understand, exactly 20 years ago, we had the Democrat Party involved, as well as Bill Clinton, in a scandal where there was secrets for money with Chinese businessmen, Chinese uh, government officials. We had people like uh, Charlie Tree, also uh, Ng Lap Singh, who is now involved again in this scandal that involved John Ash, who just mysteriously died with a barbell dropped on his neck. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same people, the same, exactly the same players, the same Chinese businessmen, the same MO. Okay. Nothing changes. They're doing exactly what they did 20 years ago because they got away with it. And they're doing it in your face again now. And this is what's so criminal about this. When we look at these statements, when they were coming after Thomas Drake, we had uh, William Welch, who was a senior litigation counselor at the time. He said, this isn't an issue of benign documents against Thomas Drake, even though I just read to you that they were benign. They were not classified documents. It was absurd what they were doing. These were schedules that had been posted, weren't classified, and these were things that were like training documents. They were coming after him in a manner of persecution. He said, when individuals go out and harm our ability, our intelligence ability, our intelligence goes dark and our soldiers in the field get harmed. That's what he said. That's the issue behind why you have national security. Mm -hmm. And yet all of that is waived. Everything that they do to us to destroy our individual liberties, to destroy our privacy, to invade us in every aspect of our life, that is all justified by this altar of national security. Mm -hmm. And what she has done is essentially sliced open a pig on this sacred altar of national security. She and the State Department and the FBI, I don't want to hear anymore about national secrets. And I don't want to hear anymore about the fact that the rest of us have to obey draconian laws that are unconstitutional while they pass. And that's the hallmark of right. a tyranny, of a dictatorship, the fact that there's these double standards and the fact that uh, they're going to go draconian and unconstitutional on us, but these people can do anything they want in public, killing people, violating state secrets, and they walk because of who they are. Right. And they think that we are so stupid, the American people, that we're going to elect someone that they're basically saying that their level of incompetence and carelessness with this was astounding. Exactly. But let's go ahead and make her the most powerful. If it's not criminal, she's amazingly incompetent. Right. Well, stick around. Margaret Howell will be joining me in studio right after this. It just couldn't be any more arrogantly brazen. Hillary Clinton has been cleared by the FBI for the heinous breach of the United States national security. Our investigation looked at whether there is evidence that classified information was improperly stored or transmitted on that personal system in violation of a federal statute that makes it a felony to mishandle classified information either intentionally or in a grossly negligent way or a second statute making it a misdemeanor to knowingly remove classified information from appropriate systems or storage facilities. And consistent with our counterintelligence responsibilities, we have also investigated to determine if there is evidence of computer intrusion by nation states or by hostile actors of any kind. Now, I have so far used the singular term email server in describing the referral that began our investigation. It turns out to have been more complicated than that. Secretary Clinton used several different servers and administrators of those servers during her four years at the State Department. Email was assessed as possibly containing classified information. The FBI referred that email to any government agency that might be an owner of that information so that agency could make a determination as to whether the email contained classified information at the time it was sent or received or whether there was reason to classify it now, even if the content had not been classified when it was first sent or received. And that's the process sometimes referred to as up-classifying. From the group of 30,000 emails returned to the State Department in 2014, 110 in 52 email chains have been determined by the owning agency to contain classified information at the time they were sent or received. Eight of those chains contained information that was top secret at the time they were sent. 36 of those chains contained secret information at the time, and eight contained confidential information at the time. That's the lowest level of classification. Separate from those, about 2,000 additional emails were up-classified to make them confidential. 
those emails had not been classified at the time that they were sent or received. Although we did not find clear evidence that Secretary Clinton or her colleagues intended to violate laws governing the handling of classified information, there is evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive information. Hillary Clinton used her Secretary of State position to set up a drop box for her million dollar clandestine espionage Clinton Foundation operation. That alone should have taken down Hillary. However, she and her husband have been dodging persecution long before her rise under Obama's reign. He should have been impeached and convicted and then I think subsequently charged with treason um, for these two transactions. In essence, uh, he ignored U.S. law to uh, trade high-level technology to the Russians, but even more egregious, he essentially took $300,000 in illegal Chinese campaign contributions, passed through uh, Johnny Chung uh, in return for their th a three-party transaction in which he, he sold the actual technology that targets our missiles, the accuracy of our mix missiles to the Chinese government. By any other name, this is treason. The elite are writing their own declaration of independence in the legacy of their puppets of globalism. And the shot has been heard around the world. Paul Joseph Watson writes, many Americans reacted furiously to the FBI's announcement that Hillary Clinton should not face criminal charges over her email scandal, with some asserting that since the former Secretary of State appears to be above the law, they would also now refuse to follow follow the law. One respondent asked, why should we follow the law when our leaders don't? This Clinton BS has sealed the deal for me. We are ruled by a corrupt cabal that is above the law. Attorney General Loretta Lynch has already said she would abide by the FBI's recommendation. Of course she will. She orchestrated it illegally right out in the open. Make no mistake about it. If Hillary is elected president, she will bring with her decades of protected criminal activity, a state of mind that she will unleash on the founding principles of the United States of America. This is how America dies. John Bound for Infowars.com. Let's go ahead and go to Sergeant B from Texas. You're on the air. Welcome. Hey, Alex. Um, I want to put a call out to everyone listening. We need everyone out there who has any skills in multimedia, audio, video, PowerPoint, slideshows, you name it, need a campaign and start putting out a list of everyone who's been prosecuted for the same crimes Hillary committed with the quote by Director Comey saying, no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case because it's obviously bull. Right in U.S. Code 793, it is stated in multiple paragraphs, very worded. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it does state very clearly what he said in that, in that press conference today, that she did commit these crimes, and it does state, shall be fined under this title or in prison not more than 10 years or both. Levin and Curlitz said, this certainly sends the signal that they are nearing an end to their investigation. Typically, the way we structured the investigations when I was a federal prosecutor is that we would seek to interview the target last. Stephen Levin continues, as you begin to interview people who are extremely close to the target of an investigation, people who are considered confidants, you typically interview those people towards the final stages of the investigation. So that way, if they tell you something that is confidential, Contrary to something you've already learned, you can immediately challenge them on that information. Tech activist Marcel Lazar, aka Guccifer, claims to have breached Hillary's server at least twice. Guccifer said he first compromised Clinton confidant Sidney Blumenthal's AOL account in March of 2013 and used that as a stepping stone to the Clinton server. He said he accessed Clinton's server like twice, though he described the contents as not interesting to him at the time. Doodles by Bill Clinton appear to back up Guccifer's claims that were released as far back as 2013. It bears repeating the extent to which Hillary violated her position in the State Department, because most people have become completely accustomed to corruption as business as usual. Here are the facts. 
As the nation's chief diplomat, Hillary Clinton was responsible for ascertaining whether information in her possession was classified and acknowledged that negligent handling of that information could jeopardize national security, according to a copy of an agreement she signed upon taking the job. A day after assuming office as Secretary of State, Clinton signed a sensitive compartmented information non-disclosure agreement that laid out criminal penalties for any unauthorized disclosure of classified information. The sensitive compartmented information non-disclosure agreement details how Hillary has been granted access to sensitive compartmented information, or SCI classified information. The agreement states that Hillary hereby acknowledges that the disclosure of SCI may constitute violations of United States criminal laws and that nothing in the agreement constitutes a waiver by the United States of the right to prosecute for any statutory violation. The agreement is also severable, meaning if one part is unenforceable, the remainder of the provisions in the agreement remain in full force and effect. Bottom line, U.S. intelligence officials determined at least four and up to 305 of the emails Hillary's aides printed out were from Hillary's personal server and were SCI at the time they were written. Two of the emails discussed classified drone information deemed top secret by the CIA. Hillary Clinton faces 10 years behind bars as required under the Espionage Act. Jeffrey Sterling, a CIA leak, was sentenced to three and a half years after disclosing national defense information concerning a covert operation. And General David Petraeus was slapped with two years probation and a fine of $100,000 for revealing classified documents to his mistress. Petraeus, a former director of the CIA, a four-star general, and CENTCOM commander, had served our country for 37 years. So why would Hillary Clinton deserve immunity? Ignorance and or negligence of Hillary's possession of highly sensitive, classified emails is no joke. In fact, if Hillary does walk away from this investigation with a slap on the wrist after she personally went to great lengths to cover up a mountain of evidence, the entire farce will demonstrate just how far gone the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Justice Department really are. Hillary's path of deception could even serve to take those departments to the cleaners if Donald Trump becomes president and keeps his word. John Bound for Infowars.com. While more than 160 people are now known to have died in Sunday's appalling attack in Baghdad. Now, this is just one of eight different attacks that are believed to have been carried out by the Islamic State over the last month. And of course, this is the Muslim month of Ramadan. Now, Ramadan is traditionally viewed as the most spiritual, most holy month in, in the Islamic calendar, a time of penance and temperance. Uh, but now it's being juxtaposed with the views of these radical Islamists who are using this as a month of conquest, plunder. They say it's uh, part of part of the history, Islamic history itself. The Prophet Muhammad, of course, waged his first jihad in the month of Ramadan. So they're, they're taking this as to be the month of war. I mean, Margaret, talk to me a little bit about just some of these attacks. And people, I know we don't talk about this a lot in the West, but these are really appalling. So these 81 bodies of the 215 that died, they were so badly charred that DNA testing is required on their bone fragments to be able to identify him, identify them. This is happening as one bomb ripped through Baghdad yesterday, hours later, early Sunday morning, a secondary bomb in this busy market. I brought you some before and after photographs. The carnage is unbelievable. Now, we're, we know, Leanne, that ISIS has claimed responsibility for this deadly attack. They've been claiming responsibility for a string of deadly attacks and suicide bombers, one in Saudi Arabia. The most heinous story coming out of um, an ISIS attack, ISIS affiliates, was in Bangladesh, aside from this Baghdad bombing, where we saw four ISIS affiliates storm into a restaurant. Anybody that couldn't cite a verse of the Quran, they were immediately tortured and killed. It's despicable. Now, this is happening all over the globe, including here in the United States, San Bernardino, Orlando, arguably ISIS affiliates, terrorism. But what we have is a central problem with our narrative. And I brought you a few clips of President Obama. Um, I, I took this from the New York Post. And he's basically an apologist. And if you, I'm going to play this clip for you. And it's remarkable. There, is, there are two words that are, that are missing in this clip. And it's so obvious to the rest of the world, except just not him. He's the one saying it. Take a listen. 
keep everybody in their thoughts and prayers. Say a prayer for them. We are praying for them today for prayer. Pray with you today. We don't yet know why this individual did what he did. None of us can know exactly what triggered this vicious attack. We've reached no definitive judgment on the precise motivations of the killer. Never know fully what causes somebody to take the life of another. We can't fully know what leads a man to do such a thing. But we're going to have to change our laws. It ought to lead to some sort of transformation. And we're going to have to come together and take meaningful action. Wow. So not only is Hillary Clinton not a criminal within this Obama administration, but also radical Islamic terrorism isn't one of our most existential threats. That's absolutely right. So he's, he refuses to use the words radical Islam. He says that we're going to call this terror. That 30 second clip, we're going to pray. He, we hear him say, we can't, we don't really know why they're doing it. We can't identify the enemy. You know, there, we really don't have a reason or a cause. His rationale is so baffling. Meanwhile, Islamic terrorism is being waged against the U.S. It's being waged against Western partners, against Christians, against non-radical Muslims. Anybody who dares stand up to radical Islam is beheaded, drowned, forced to be a sex slave. And yet our president refuses to identify it. And I just want to say that radical Islam in some articles, um, and you and I talked about this offset, it's being identified as the number one threat to the U.S. currently. That's right. it. So how can we have the CIA, CIA director coming out and saying, expect these attacks here? It's it just seems like absolutely they probably already have them planned. And then we have a president who goes and plays golf because he knows he's on his way out. And his main agenda is to just continue to whitewash this threat. You're absolutely right. So there seems to be an ulterior motive to this president for not wanting to call this what it is. And it's been written about extensively um, in every speech that he gives, wanting to pray for victims, pray for victims. Well, who's he praying to, Leanne? I don't understand this guy. You know, we, we need we have a very serious threat in radical Islam and it's waged a war. And Ramadan is, is considered to be a holy month. So if we're talking about radicalized Islam, they consider this a holy month for their holy war. These attacks are holy to them and they have every right to wage them on anybody that's a non-believer to them. So we have a serious problem. You're absolutely right. He'd rather be playing golf, going to his vacation house, budding around with celebrities, doing anything that he can except identifying serious threats to this country. You brought up an excellent point. We talked about the CIA director, John Brennan, who off the cuff said last week, he knows that ISIS is planning to attack the U.S., similar to what they did in Turkey. He just doesn't know when or where. If that's not a serious threat to the U.S., I don't know what is. Do you think it's just more important to them to be able to get open borders, to get their globalism, to push through the one world government, that they're so willing to endanger the lives of everyone, including themselves? That's why Trump has had such a powerful message, because people are they're awake. They understand uh, that the, the political elites in this country, they have a very specific agenda. And it is an open border policy. It is a non-vetting process for a mass influx of refugees coming from ISIS heavy areas, uh, parts of Syria instead of. And I'm all for humanitarian aid. I'm all for helping victims of tragedy. I think that we as a nation, you know, but who why does does this administration think that we have a blind eye to this mass influx of people that are, that are not being vetted? And then, of course, we have our CIA director come out and say, oh, guess what? By the way, there's going to be another attack, but we're not going to do anything to close the floodgates and properly vet people coming in the country. Right. What are they going to do when there is a sort of massive attack like we've seen in a lot of these airports around the globe. I mean, what are they going to do at that point? Well, what we saw the president do in the Omar Mateen attack, uh, we saw an all out assault in the Second Amendment, blaming uh, people that, that own guns in this country, blaming Christians, blaming everything except for radical Islam. Every single thing got a blame except for that PC buzzword. We can't say that. I'm fully expecting, Leanne, I mean, the PC police are so on top of this. They're trying to criminalize, you know, making it a form of hate speech to even call this war what it is. Uh, so I think that if we see another attack, we're going to see the same old rhetoric because it keeps, you know, it's it's cyclical. It's the same rhetoric, rhetoric. If you listen to his speeches over and over, the same buzzwords. It's a gun problem. It's a, it's a you know, a, a, a racist problem. It's, a, it's everything except for what it is. Right. And of course, we know decades ago, Eric Holder said that that was what they were going to have to do is say this over and over and over again, almost brainwash the people into accepting that it's a gun problem. It's not radical Islam. And we see so many people pushing back against that. And I, you know, obviously, there's billions of Muslims in the world. Obviously, they're not all terrorists. We get that. But we can't overlook the fact that there are people who truly believe that they are practicing 
the, the real and true Islamic faith here with committing jihad during the month of Ramadan. I mean, do we expect now that the month is over? Is this going to end until next year? I don't think that we're going to see an end to the attempts of radical Islam to wipe us off the face of the earth because they feel that they're they're engaged in a holy war with us. I think that Ramadan, you know, they they called to step up these attacks during this period. But Lee and the ruthless. There there are no rules to this. This isn't war. It's guerrilla warfare. It's it's not a game of of you know what whatever we can expect. You know, the engaging in the rules of war. This is guerrilla warfare. They understand it very well. Unfortunately, it looks like our leadership doesn't. Right. Well, and I know that WikiLeaks and some other groups are planning on attacking um, Huma Abedin and her ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And don't you think if Trump, his biggest aide for 20 something years, had ties to a terrorist organization that other countries have kicked the Muslim Brotherhood out of their country with their ties to terrorism, <clears throat> yet this is Clinton's closest aide. I mean, is that not a, a red flag? And why aren't they calling her? You know, they would call Trump out on it. You know, Trump cannot get away with anything. We've seen this time and again. Hillary Clinton has given, been given a free pass. If Trump had hidden or deleted emails, used a private server as Secretary of State, we'd be calling for a war tribunal against him. You know, <laughs> it, it, that's an act of espionage. You know, we, we would actually, he would be nailed to the wall. Um, what she's allowed to do in relation to him is astounding what the media allows her to get away with. And just taking us back to Clinton for a second, we understand that the FBI has thoroughly gone through the uh, email scandal and nothing is coming of this. So, uh, you know, back to Homa, fellow GW grad, I don't know um, if Trump would, would have the same response, the same welcoming of the media if, in fact, um, he had anybody on his staff that was remotely even displaying an aggressive personality, Leanne, much less anything else. You know? Right. Like, yeah. Wow. Just no wow. stone left unturned. Exactly. And so that's why it's just so frightening to me to see that they are going to just no matter what back Hillary Clinton on every single direction, even now with the FBI director coming out and listing the many reasons why she should be thrown the book, but he's not going to do it. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you guys for tuning in to the show tonight. If you're watching us in, on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. And we will see you here again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central.